Hi there. This is going to be an in-depth look at the origin of male genital mutilation, commonly labeled, or called, circumcision. We will also be looking at God's witness against it, and, why the practice was never commanded by God, and indeed, contradicts countless scriptures and the very nature of God, as portrayed in the scriptures themselves. The Bible translations used will be mostly KJV, with some ASV, and YLT. In this study we will mainly use the word, mutilate, or, genital mutilation, when referring to circumcision in their, human, physical sense. The reason for this, is because by definition, circumcision, or, cutting off the foreskin of the male penis, is mutilation, and, mutilate, describes the actual damage done, whereas, circumcision, has cultural tags and labels associated with it, often with incorrect preconceived assumptions. Here are some definitions of mutilation from various dictionaries. 1. To cut up or alter radically so as to make imperfect. 2 to cut off or permanently destroy a limb or essential part of, 3, to injure, disfigure, or make imperfect by removing or irreparably damaging parts, 4, to deprive a person or animal of a limb or other essential part, we will also use other words, as shown by analogy, in the relevant scriptures, when the word, circumcision, is used in a non- physical sense, such as, spiritual circumcision, or, circumcision of the heart. Let us start with 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Most people consider what is commonly known as the Bible to be scripture as a whole, but, the scriptures in the Bible were compiled from many Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, and even the Old Testament books as we know them today were sometimes compiled from as few as one, all the way up to as many as four different Jewish scholars, or scribes' writings. In most cases, the different writings say essentially the same thing, sometimes in slightly different ways. But, when a writing or scripture, directly contradicts other scriptures, or contradicts the nature of God, that is taught by the rest of the scriptures, as is the case with male genital mutilation, we have to look closely and study the scriptures as a whole, to determine if the passages in question are really inspired by God or not. Although, there is no absolute proof, based on linguistics and writing styles, as well as the texts themselves, scholars believe, that there were at least three main sources for Genesis and the rest of the books in the Pentateuch. This is evident in the different accounts of creation, at the start of Genesis, and later in the account of the flood where more than one version of events is presented, with some differences as is the case with the account of creation. Earlier in Genesis, these sources are usually labeled as, J, E, and P, the P, or priestly source, is believed to be from around 597 BC, making it the newest of the three sources. Interestingly, the first place in the Bible where genital mutilation is found, is in the P source of Genesis, which we will study in more detail later. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Acts 15, 18, says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, 
and today, and forever. And, James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Here is the proof, in Scripture, that God is not the author of confusion, or conflicting commands and that God has known every decision he would make, before he created the universe and Jesus Christ, who is equal with God, does not change ever. Before starting, we need to fully understand what the word circumcise or circumcision really describes when we read it in the following text, particularly when it refers to physical genital mutilation, we also need to understand what the word, circumcise, or, circumcised, describes, when it does not refer to physical mutilation, but instead, refers to a metaphor. We will describe physical circumcision or mutilation first. If you look at the definition of the Hebrew and Greek words for circumcise, it means, to cut around, to cut off the foreskin of the penis, and, to uncover, the foreskin has thousands of nerves and the many uses as well as benefits, but, in the simplest form, it is a protective covering. According to the Meissner, or verbally passed on history, tradition, and other historical, Jewish text, the process of circumcision would involve taking an eight-day-old child, and one, or both, of the parents, would either hold the child, or assist an outside person in using a flint knife to crush or sever the foreskin against a rock. After this, a mixture of spices, and wine or saliva, would be applied to the open wound, in an attempt to stop the bleeding, and prevent infection. It is worth noting that there were cases historically recorded where Jewish children died either from blood loss or infections caused by genital mutilation, circumcision. Jewish priest, after biblical times, and possibly before also, had rules in place that allowed a Jewish child to skip circumcision, if the mother's previous child had died from the genital mutilation practice. While the physical, genital mutilation or circumcision was a bloody ritual, that no doubt traumatized the eight-day-old child, as well as the parents participating in the mutilation of their child's genitals, spiritual circumcision was totally different. Spiritual circumcision, did not involve mutilation, or blood, or permanently changing someone else's genitals, that, according to Genesis 9-6 and, 1 Corinthians 12, 18, 26, are designed by God to be a part of the body, and to serve a purpose, within the body as a whole. Deuteronomy 10 16, reads, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. Likewise, Deuteronomy 30, 6, says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, and the heart of your offspring, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, that you may live. These are examples of spiritual circumcision. In the first reference God tells the Jews to circumcise the foreskin of your heart or uncover, lay bare, expose your heart, the reason is that they will not be stiff-necked. The definition of this word, stiff-necked, means, to be dense, that is, tough or severe, to be cruel, to be fierce, to be hard, hearted, God is calling them, the Jews, hard-hearted cruel, intentionally dense, and spitefully mean. In the second reference, God says the same thing. Uncover, expose, your heart, be gentle, and love the Lord your God with every aspect of your being, so that you may live. This agrees with, Mark 12 28, 31, where Jesus, quoting from the old scriptures, 
answers in the following way. And one of the scribes came, and heard them questioning together, and knowing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. The second is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. This shows how opposite spiritual circumcision is to genital mutilation. If someone has an open, tender heart towards God and towards other people, as Jesus just quoted, genital mutilation or any type of harm directed towards others, excluding self-defense and war, is gone. At the same time, Someone who forcibly cuts off and mutilates part of another person's genitals describes perfectly the person who has a covered, hard, cruel heart. Now we will give the scriptures in order where God, allegedly, specifically, commands physical, male, genital mutilation. After this, we will give the scriptures that contradict genital mutilation. Finally, we will examine, in detail, how the first set contradicts the second set, and countless other scriptures, as well as the nature of God, as taught in the scriptures. References that allegedly command genital mutilation will be placed on the left, and references that go against this, will be placed on the right. Genesis 17, 9 through 13, says. And God said unto Abraham, And as for thee, thou shalt keep my covenant, thou, and thy seed after thee throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee, every male among you shall be circumcised and ye shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of a covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every male throughout your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any foreigner that is not thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Genesis 17 is from there, p. Source of Writings Leviticus 12, 1 through 3, says, And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman conceive seed, and bear a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of the impurity of her sickness shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. This text is also from there, p. Source Joshua 5, 2, says, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now, here are scriptures that contradict the previous references. Genesis 15, 1, through 21. We will read this later because of the length. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Matthew 18, 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18, 10 Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Leviticus 19, 18 Thou shalt not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, 
but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am Jehovah. Luke 6, 31, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. John 7, 22, 24 Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every bit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Mark 12, 28 through 31, which we read already. Romans 13, 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Galatians 5, 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 1 Corinthians 7, 19 Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Romans 2, 23-29 Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? and shall not uncircumcision which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. Mark 7, 6-7 He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Acts 15 24, For as much as we have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised, and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Philippians 3, 2, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision, the word concision here means to cut down, or cut off to mutilate, specifically, to mutilate the genitals, Titus 1, 10 through 16, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, or genital mutilation, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for money's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The cretins are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, and commandments of men, that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Galatians 5, 
Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I Paul say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Galatians 5, 10 through 12. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. I would they were even cut off which trouble you. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 26. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it, and if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Okay, now that we have read both categories of scriptures we will go back and examine in extreme detail what these scriptures actually say and how they contradict each other. This is going to be slow, but is absolutely necessary, to truly understand why. As documented in scripture, God never commanded the genital mutilation of children. We are going to start with, Genesis 17, 1 through 27, and, Genesis 15, 1 through 21 which are actually different accounts of the same conversation between Abraham and God. This will be shown with scripture, as we read on, Genesis 15, 1 through 21. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Ilsa of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and, lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and, lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. 
and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation, whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass, that, when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace, and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made the covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. The Kenites, and the Kenites, and the Cadmonites and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephames, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Gergashites, and the Jebusites. Now the different account of the same event, Genesis 17 reads, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram, and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations, neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou, and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep, between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be and I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, 
and God went up from Abraham, and Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him, and Abraham was ninety years old and nine, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old, when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, in the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised, and Ishmael his son and all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Notice, Genesis 15, verses 1, 4, 5, 6, and, 7 through 21. In verse 1, God, appears, in a vision to Abraham saying, Don't be, afraid, I am your shield or defense and your exceedingly great reward. In verse 4, God promises Abraham a legitimate son for an heir other than Ishmael. In verse 5 God promises that Abraham's descendants from his future son Isaac will be innumerable. In verse 6 God declares Abraham righteous because he had faith regarding his future son Isaac and believed God. The word righteous here comes from a root meaning, to be morally right, cleanse, clear oneself. In verse 7 God promises to give Abraham the promised land which he details later. In verse 8 Abraham asks God for a sign to show he will in fact inherit the land. In verse 9 to 17 Abraham prepares a sacrifice of animals and cuts them in half except for the birds. Later that evening a smoking furnace and burning lamp pass between the pieces of meat as a sign that God will keep his covenant regarding the promised land. In verse 18 to 21 God explains in more detail where the land will be. Now notice, Genesis 17 verses 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8 and 9, then 10 through 27. In verse 1 God, appears, to Abraham and, commands, that he, walk before me, and, be you perfect. Note, how God commands Abraham to, be perfect, this is the opposite of Genesis 15 verse 6, where God himself, declares, Abraham to be, righteous, or perfect, because of his faith. This is also shown in Romans 4, 3 and 4, 13. In verse 2 God says, I will make a covenant or promise with you, and will make your descendants many. In verses 4 and 6 God repeats and expands on verse 2. In verse 7 God details that his covenant with Abraham will be to all future generations, and then adds to the covenant, to be a God unto you and your descendants. In verse 8 God adds, all the land of Canaan, to the covenant. In verse 9, God, commands, Abraham and his descendants to, keep the covenant. This covenant is now, one. I will make your descendants many. 2. You will be the father of many nations. 3. I will be your God and your descendants God. 4. I will give you all the land of Canaan and the land where you are a stranger. Now we come to verse 10, where events start to get bloody. First, note how Genesis 17, verses 2 through 9, and Genesis 15 verses 1 through 8, essentially, are the same account from different writers. Also note, how the, sign, of the covenant in the Genesis 17 account, is still missing. In verse 10, God allegedly commands a new, separate, additional covenant, of a blood sacrifice of children's genitals, more specifically, eight-day-old, male, infant, for skins. Then in verse 11, God, allegedly, says that this blood ritual, mutilation, of the foreskin, will be a, token, 
or sign of the covenant which covenant will this blood sacrifice of infant genitals be a sign of the covenant of genital mutilation or the covenant detailed before verse 10 that is completely different and is still missing the sign this is a complete contradiction of the sign in genesis 15 9 in genesis 15 9 abraham cuts or separates animals in half and sacrifices them to god in genesis 17 10 through 13 god allegedly commands abraham to cut the foreskins of eight day old male infants and separate or sever them the foreskin as a type of genital blood sacrifice in genesis 17 17 through 18 Abraham laughs in God's face when he promises a son through his wife Sarah, and then says, essentially, make Ishmael my heir and bless him. This is definitely not faith, and is a complete contradiction to Genesis 15, 2-6, where Abraham believes God, and is called by God, righteous, because of his faith. Already, we have major contradictions and we have not even left the book of Genesis. To summarize, we have three contradictions so far. 1. God declaring Abraham righteous or perfect because of his faith, versus God commanding Abraham to be perfect, implying that he wasn't perfect or right before God. 2. Abraham responding in faith regarding his promised future son Isaac, versus Abraham laughing in God's face regarding his future son Isaac. 3. A covenant with a sign, or seal, of an animal sacrifice, versus, one, or two covenants, with a sign, or seal of male, infant, genital, foreskin sacrifice. Now for the next set of verses we will list the contradictions as we study the verses in depth. Leviticus 12, 1, 3, reads, And Jehovah spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman conceive seed, and bear a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days, as in the days of the impurity of her sickness shall she be unclean, and in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Note that God is speaking directly to Moses, and, that God commands Moses to mutilate the genitals, if a woman has a male baby. Also note, that this is the book of Leviticus, and God is commanding Moses what to write in the Jewish law. John 7, 24, reads. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every bit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment contradiction 1 and 2. Note, that in verse 22, Jesus states that Moses included circumcision in the law, not because he, Moses, wanted to, but because it originated from the fathers, not, God. This contradicts Leviticus which states, that God, directly, commanded Moses to circumcise, the word, fathers, here is probably referring to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, or possibly referring to the religious leaders of Moses' day. Also note what Jesus does not say. He does not say, Moses gave you genital mutilation because it was from God. He does not say, Moses gave you genital mutilation because it was from me. Why? Because, in the next verse, Jesus contrasts their mutilation of a man against his making whole a man. In 
John 5, 18, and John 8, 58, Jesus claims to be equal with God, and also claims to be the I Am, that spoke to Moses from the burning bush, in Exodus 3, 6 and 3, 14. If Jesus had said, Moses gave you genital mutilation, because it was from I Am, he would have been contradicting himself, God, by comparing his God's ordered mutilation in Leviticus and Genesis 17 with his God's healing. Instead, Jesus does say, Moses gave you genital mutilation because it was from the fathers. This is a direct contradiction of Genesis 17, 10 through 14, which states that he, Jesus, I am, or God, commanded genital mutilation. Note that Jesus says that they mutilate a man on the Sabbath, not a child or infant. The word man here refers to an adult man. Why? Because by mutilating the genitals of an eight day old infant child, you also mutilate the man he becomes one day. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 22 and 25 through 26 says about the human body, but our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it, and if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Contradiction 3 John 7:23. If a man on the Sabbath day receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me, because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? The word, wit, here means, down to the smallest, measurable, particle, combine this with the word, whole, and Jesus states that, he has made the man, whole, or, complete down to their last atom. Obviously, the man mentioned that Jesus healed in John 5, 5 through 16, was Jewish, so he would have been mutilated, but Jesus healed not only his sickness, but also reversed and restored the man's genitals to their natural state. Jesus clearly contrasts the genital mutilation given by man to the making completely whole by himself i am god jesus sends with john 7 24 judge not according to the appearance but judge righteous judgment note that jesus says judge not by appearance why for multiple reasons one the pharisees and sadducees taught based on genesis 17 1 and 17 10 through 13, that man was imperfect, and that the foreskin was unnecessary, vestigial, or flawed. They taught that when God commanded Abraham to be perfect, in Genesis 17, 1, and then commanded genital mutilation, it was to correct the flawed, sinful, male body, and make one perfect before God. This however contradicts 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 26 and Genesis 9, 6. This is the main reason Jesus says to not judge by appearance, they taught genital mutilation, by appearance, was necessary to be right, and perfect before God. Jesus, says the opposite, by restoring the man's genitals and healing his sickness, he then closes by saying, appearance, of genitals, doesn't matter to God, once again contradicting Genesis 17. This is, no doubt, one of the reasons they were trying to kill Jesus, after the healing, the Jewish man was now unmutilated, and in their view, was no longer right before God.
too, they, the religious leaders also taught, in addition to the law of Moses, that healing or helping someone on the Sabbath was work and thereby prohibited in the law of Moses. However, in their view it was okay to mutilate a child's genitals on the Sabbath, because Moses commanded it. So, by their interpretation and addition of the law, Jesus, by appearance, was breaking the Sabbath. Mark 7, 6, 7, says. He, Jesus, answered and said unto them, The religious leaders, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Joshua 5, 2 through 9. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make thee sharp knives, and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise all the people that came out of Egypt, that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness. By the way, after they came out of Egypt, now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord under whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land, which the Lord sware unto their fathers that he would give us, a land that floweth with milk and honey, and their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised, because they had not circumcised them by the way. And it came to pass, when they had done circumcising all the people, that they abode in their places in the camp, till they were whole. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Here again, God allegedly commands genital mutilation, but this time, it is with boys and full-grown men. Notice that in verse 5 and 7 that all the men born in the wilderness had not been mutilated, but, all the men that came out of Egypt, had been mutilated. Also notice, that in verse 6, all the men of war that came out of Egypt, who were mutilated, are the ones that God swore not to allow into the promised land, the reason given, is that they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. But, their disobedience, as described in, Exodus 16, 1, 2, Numbers 14, 2, and 16, and, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10, had nothing to do with circumcision. This is further supported because, they, the circumcised men, are the ones that murmured against the Lord complained and worshipped various idols, they also committed various sins listed in 1 Corinthians 10. Note as well, all the men born in the wilderness, and on the way, were uncircumcised, or, unmutilated. This, is actually a direct contradiction to, Genesis 17, 10 through 14, because, according to Genesis 17:14 and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant. So, all the uncircumcised men born in the wilderness, should have been cut off, according to Genesis 17, 14, and all the circumcised men that disobeyed God were either killed, or died. Where? is Israel, with no men left, if, Genesis 17 10 through 14, were truly, God inspired, then all their, 
uncircumcised, younger men should have been cut off from their people. But, we find instead, that they were in fact the ones that had obeyed the voice of the Lord, and would inherit the promised land. We will continue now to examine various scriptures, what they actually are saying, and how they contradict these three from the Old Testament. As we read earlier, Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. This contradicts Genesis 17, mutilating an infant's, who can't even speak yet, genitals, would certainly qualify as shedding man's blood, and, mutilating a man's body, made in the image of God, and calling it an improvement, would be an insult to God, and his design of man's body. Exodus 4, 24 through 26, and it came to pass on the way at the lodging place, that Jehovah met him, Moses, and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah, Moses' wife, took a flint, knife, and cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet, and she said, Surely a bridegroom of blood art thou to me. So he, God, let him, Moses, alone. Then she, Zipporah, said, A bridegroom of blood art thou because of the circumcision. This small passage is very suspect as scripture for many reasons. Number 1, in verse 24, we are told that God is, trying, to kill Moses, because he has not circumcised his son. God however, doesn't need to try, to kill anyone, he could simply do it at any time, with no effort. Number 2. Ironically, even though this passage, no doubt, is placed here to support the Genesis 17 command to mutilate genitals, it actually contradicts it, because Moses's son is no longer an infant here, and, he is still not circumcised. Note, where Zipporah throws her son's foreskin at Moses's feet, this word, feet, is a euphemism for the male genitals. So she actually throws the bloody foreskin of their son at Moses's genitals. Also note, Zipporah is very distressed and angry at Moses, not God, because she has just been made to use a flint knife to crush, sever the foreskin of her son's penis. Then, she essentially calls Moses a bloody mutilator of a husband and throws the foreskin at Moses' genitals in retaliation, once again, showing she was fully opposed, to the mutilation, of her son. Lastly, note that, God, is satisfied with the blood foreskin sacrifice and decides not to kill Moses because of it. However, there are no other scriptures except for the suspect ones listed here, that support or even imply that God ever commanded human sacrifices of any kind whether ears, fingers, genitals or cuttings. Matthew 18, 6 But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you, that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. The word offend here means, to trap, cause to stumble, to offend, and the word despise means, to look down on, think less of. So, if those who offend, or trip, or look down on children are deserving of worse than death and, the children's angels always stand before God. How much worse the punishment, for those that shed the blood, and mutilate children's genitals. This, a contradiction of Genesis 17. The God that knows everything about children, and talks to their angels that watch over them on earth did not command a ritual genital mutilation, of the same children. Leviticus 19, 
18, Thou shalt not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am Jehovah. Luke 6, 31, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Mark 12, 28 through 31. And one of the scribes came, and heard them questioning together, and knowing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. The second is this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Romans 13, 10 Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. The word, ill, means, bad, evil, harm. So, love works no harm to his neighbor. 1 John 4 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Galatians 5, 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Genital mutilation would certainly qualify as harm, so all these contradict Genesis 17, Acts 15, 1, 2, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, and certain other of them, should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Later in, Acts 15, 24. For as much as we have heard, that certain men which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised, and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Notice here, the Jewish clergy are attempting to get early Christians to be circumcised because, as we saw earlier from Genesis 17, they taught it was necessary to be right with God and the same thing is echoed here in the words of Acts 1 Corinthians 7, 19, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Note, as we will see later, Paul is talking about physical circumcision here but in a spiritual aspect. Remember from earlier that the Jews taught circumcision was necessary to make one right before God. But here, Paul is stating that physical circumcision and uncircumcision was worthless in a spiritual sense to make one right with God. He, contrast, physical circumcision for spiritual justification, against, keeping God's commands. This is another contradiction to Genesis 17, 10, since the, God, commands, circumcision, whereas, here, circumcision has nothing to do with God's commands. Before reading this next section, we need to understand, that when you find the words, the circumcision, in scripture, this is simply a way of referring to the Jews, since most Jews were circumcised. Likewise, the uncircumcision, or, the uncircumcised, simply refers to Gentiles, or non-Jewish people of any nation, since most other peoples did not mutilate their genitals. Romans 2, 23-29 Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, for circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, 
thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. Note in verse 23 and 24 how Paul accuses the Jews, who boasted in the law, of breaking it and thereby dishonouring God, and also causing the name of God to be blasphemed by the Gentiles. Both the Romans and Greeks of Paul's day, as well as other cultures, looked on the Jewish practice of genital mutilation with disdain, to say the least. They regarded the Jews, as that, weird, cruel people whose God commanded them to cut their son's genitals. This is why Paul says, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written, The Gentiles didn't care about the Jews breaking the law of Moses, since they regularly committed most sins described there as part of their daily lives. They did however recognize that cutting genitals was wrong and mocked the Jewish God because of it. This agrees with, Romans 2, 14 through 15, which says, For when Gentiles that have not the law do by nature the things of the law, these, not having the law, are the law unto themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness therewith and their thoughts one with another accusing or else excusing them. We will see at the end of this section why genital mutilation broke or went against the law of Moses. Then in verse 25, For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. He states that circumcision is valuable if you keep the law, but, if you break it, you are, made, or, become, uncircumcised. How can a circumcised person, become, uncircumcised? By breaking the law of Moses? Do his mutilated genitals magically restore themselves to the natural state? No. As we see later in verse 28 and 29 Paul explains that he is not talking about physical circumcision or mutilation, but states that the true Jew is someone who has a circumcised, or open uncovered, tender heart. Now things start to make sense. If we reword verse 25, to clarify, it reads like this, For a sensitive uncovered heart is good if you keep the law of Moses, but if you break the law, your uncovered heart will turn into a hard covered heart. Verse 26 Therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Therefore if a Gentile, with natural genitals, keeps the law, won't his Gentile status, with natural body and covered genitals, be considered a Jewish status with a sensitive and uncovered heart? Verse 27 And shall not uncircumcision which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision dost transgress the law? Note the word, uncircumcision. Here is not referring to the heart because Paul continues by saying, if, it, the uncircumcision, keeps the law. We saw previously in verse 25 that there, uncircumcised in heart, are those that break the law of Moses. But, here, the uncircumcision means, physically uncircumcised or, Gentile, likewise, circumcision. Here, refers to physical mutilation, as we will explain now. 
In the phrase, who by the letter, the word translated, by, actually means, a channel of action, through, because of, some translations attempt to change the word, by, to, having, or, possessing, making it a possessive word, but with no action, however, this is an attempt to subvert the truth Paul is showing here. Paul actually says, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge you, the Jew, who, because of, or, through, the letter, and circumcision, dost transgress the law. Notice how the meaning of the whole verse changes and becomes clearer once we correctly translate the word, by, Paul is stating, that those who practice physical circumcision, genital mutilation, are breaking the law of Moses, and also, that those practicing the, letter, or, code, probably referring to the Meissner since it is obviously not the law of Moses, are also breaking the law of Moses. Once again, circumcision here cannot refer to circumcision of the heart because as Paul stated in verse 25 those who break the law are the uncircumcised, hard-hearted, whereas here, because of circumcision, and the code, they, the Jews, like mentioned in Acts 15 to 1, are breaking the law of Moses. Here are all the verses together, reworded where necessary for clarification. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written, for a sensitive uncovered heart is good if you keep the law of Moses, but if you break the law, your uncovered heart will turn into a hard covered heart. Therefore if the Gentile keeps the law, won't his Gentile status, with covered genitals, be considered the Jewish status with a sensitive and uncovered heart? And won't the Gentile, man or woman, with God-given natural genitals, who lives out the law of Moses, the law of love, judge you, who because of, by cause of, the Jewish code, and the tradition of genital mutilation, do break, go against the law of Moses, the law of love, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of man, but of God. Regarding the law of love above, as we studied earlier in Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Any person living out this commandment has fulfilled the whole law. This passage completely contradicts every scripture we saw in the Old Testament where the same God of Moses allegedly commands genital mutilation, but here Paul clearly states that those practicing physical circumcision, or genital mutilation, are going against the law of love and thereby the entire law of Moses. Philippians 3, 2 Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the concision, the word concision here means to cut down, or cut off, to mutilate, specifically, to mutilate the genitals, here again, is a warning to stay away from those teaching genital mutilation, Titus 1, 10 through 16 for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, or genital mutilation, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for money's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Grecians are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies, this witness is true. Wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, and commandments of men, that turn from the truth. 
unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Notice, in verses 10 and 11 Paul states that there, talkers, and, deceivers, especially those, of the ritual of mutilation, were teaching things they should not teach, for money's sake. In verse 12, one of their own, says they are, liars, evil, lazy. In verse 13, Paul says, it's true, rebuke them so that they may be sound in the faith not giving credit to, Jewish fables, and, commandments of men, that turn from the truth. Notice how Paul says, that the teachers of the, the ritual mutilation, are teaching Jewish myths or fables and commands of, men, that turn, from the truth. It doesn't get much more direct than this, Paul is stating that, Genital mutilation, was a Jewish myth, and commanded by men. Notice how Paul ends, in verse 16, by calling these, teachers, fakes, professing to know God, but in works, genital mutilation for justification, denying God, being abominable, or disgusting, and disobedient. This is coming from Paul, who was a Jew circumcised on the eighth day, an expert on Jewish manuscripts and law. Of all people, Paul should have been the last person to denounce genital mutilation, since it was the core Jewish mandate, that made a person right before God. Here is, Galatians 5, 1 through 12, with some rewording to clarify. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I Paul say unto you, that if ye be physically mutilated, for spiritual justification, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is physically mutilated, for spiritual justification, before God, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law only, ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Jesus Christ neither physical mutilation availeth anything, nor natural genitals, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord, that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision of the heart, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offence of the cross ceased, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Note that once again Paul starts talking about the yoke of bondage, referring to genital mutilation mentioned in Acts 15, and goes on to explain why genital cutting has no spiritual value. Then note in verse 7 how he asks, who hindered you that you should not obey the truth. This implies that they, the early Christians, were starting to bend in the direction of the bondage of genital mutilation and away from the truth, which as we saw Jesus point out earlier, genital mutilation has no basis with God. In verse 12, Paul uses the words, cut off. The actual translation means, to castrate or completely cut off one's genitals. So, Paul is actually saying, I wish that those teaching genital mutilation and troubling you would mutilate, completely cut off, their own genitals. Why does Paul say this? Because he recognizes how wrong and evil genital mutilation is and is enraged with righteous anger, to the point of wishing they, 
who wanted early Christians to practice genital mutilation, would finish the job of genital mutilation and completely castrate themselves. Note however that he does not wish to do, it, castrate, to them, but that they would do it, to themselves, now, once again, later in, Galatians 6, 11 through 13, Paul warns about mutilation again. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Notice that, they, who wanted early Christians mutilated wanted two things, one, to escape persecution, as Christians, because they could claim they were Jews by circumcision, two, that they, genital mutilators, might glory in your physical bodily appearance. This once again harkens back to Jesus commanding to judge not by appearance, whereas, they, wanted to glory in and be justified by appearance, but not before God. If we look now at, Romans 4, 1 through 25. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, physical appearance, circumcision, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, circumcision, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, under whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, how was it then reckoned? when he was in circumcision, or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Note, in verses 1 and 2 how Abraham was not justified by works, circumcision, before God. This agrees with Jesus' contradiction of their mutilation to be, perfect, as they taught from Genesis 17. Note, in verses 9 and 10, that Abraham was considered, right, or, righteous, because of his faith. This was, before, his physical circumcision. Abraham, with his God-given natural body, was perfect, or right, before God already because of faith. He did not need to mutilate his genitals in order to please God. Note in verses 11 and 12, 1, Abraham received the sign of circumcision, 2, it, the sign of circumcision, was a seal of his righteous standing with God, while he was what? While he was uncircumcised. How did Abraham receive their seal or sign of physical circumcision while he was uncircumcised. Because, once again, Paul is talking about spiritual circumcision here. As we saw in verses 1 through 4, you can't have a physical, works-based, seal, of, spiritual, 
Righteousness Spiritual righteousness must have a spiritual seal, the spiritual circumcision of the heart towards God. This is further supported by verse 12 where he says, He, Abraham, would be the father of circumcision, to those who are not circumcised, Gentiles, as well as those, of the circumcision, Jews. How can Abraham be the father of circumcision to those who are not circumcised? Because, once again, this is spiritual circumcision. Abraham is the father of spiritual circumcision, not mutilation, for Gentiles and Jews. As we explained earlier, the phrase, of the circumcision, simply refers to the Jews, reworded, Verses 9 through 10 would read like this Cometh this blessedness then upon the Jew only, or upon the Gentile also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, how was it then reckoned? When he was physically mutilated, or physically natural, not in mutilation, but in the physically natural state. And he received the sign of spiritual circumcision of the heart, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being physically uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not physically circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of spiritual circumcision of the heart to them who are not mutilated Jews only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet physically natural, physically uncircumcised. In verses 13 and 14, for the promise, that he should be the heir of the world, was not to Abraham, or to his seed, through the law but through the righteousness of faith, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. This agrees once again with Genesis 15, faith, righteousness and animal sacrifice, but contradicts Genesis 17, lack of righteousness, lack of faith and genital sacrifice. Paul is saying, you can't have it both ways. Either it's physical mutilation and works by the law or it's spiritual circumcision of the heart and faith. In verses 17 through 22, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that, what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Notice, that in verse 19, Paul says that Abraham's age was, about a hundred years old when this promise was given. But, he quotes from the Genesis 15 account, namely, so shall thy seed be, Genesis 15 to 5 and the Genesis 17 account, I have made thee a father of many nations, Genesis 17, 5, Genesis 15, does not give Abraham's age, Genesis 17 however, does give his age as 99 years old, this is further evidence that Genesis 15 and Genesis 17 are different accounts of the same event and polar opposites in many ways, as we have been studying. Finally, we come to, 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 26. But our bodies, have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, 
I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it, and if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Notice verses 18, 21 and 26. God has intentionally placed every part of the human body where He wants it. Every part of the human body is necessary. If one part of the body, genitals or other, is damaged, wounded, or mutilated, the whole body is damaged or suffers as a whole. Result. This agrees with Jesus making a man, whole, or, complete, in John. Matthew 19, 4 through 6, reads. And he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason shall a man leave father and mother, and shall become one with his wife, and they two shall be one body? Wherefore they are no more two, but one body. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man separate. Here we see the effect circumcision, mutilation has on the physical sexual and emotional aspect of marriage. If one mutilated, damaged body is joined with another whole harmonious body in the sexual aspect of marriage, will the resulting combined body not suffer as well? How can the two bodies combine to form one whole body? If one is suffering, won't the resulting sexual, emotional union suffer from the loss of the one body as well? God designed whole male and whole female bodies to come together in marriage in a whole combined union or new body, not a mutilated and a whole body suffering, because of the foolish lies of men pretending to be God. Sadly, once again, we see that the lies of men who say that mutilation of the genitals doesn't affect a person's sexuality, and body as a whole, are wrong, when compared to the previous 1 Corinthians reference. And, these same people, who claim that male genital mutilation doesn't affect sex, or the sexual aspect of marriage, are wrong again when compared to Matthew 19. In summary, we can clearly see, by carefully studying the scriptures as the Bereans, to see if those things were so, that God never commanded genital mutilation of any kind, and, that God is not left without a witness as, Acts 14, 17, says, according to, Malachi 3, 6, Hebrews 13, 8, and, James 1, 17. God never changes, according to, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the author of confusion, or conflicting commands. These four scriptures, combined with everything we just studied, are proof that God didn't command genital mutilation in the Old Testament, and then change his mind in the inspired writings of the New Testament. To say the opposite, we clearly see that in Genesis 17, the genital mutilation portion, and, lack of faith of Abraham, are clearly, not, scripture, when held up in light of the rest of scripture. We also clearly see that the modern belief, as well as the Jewish belief, that circumcision or mutilation makes anything, better, is a lie when held up to the truth of, 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 26. In closing, John 8:32, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free.